one of the goals that we are trying to accomplish every day when working as network engineers is to build a reliable network. Having a redundant connection to internet is just one step to accomplish that goal. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to use more than one service provider in your network. And additionally, we'll add recursive routing to get a pretty solid solution. Welcome to the network trip. What exactly do I mean by failover? So we see this network diagram in your screen now. We have a local area network connected to that border router. Inside that yellow circle, we can have any topology, any amount of routers, switches, firewall. But the idea is that we have in some point a router at the edge, the border router. So in that router, in this case, we have two internet service providers. One is going to have a higher priority. And the second one is going to be just the backup connection with a lower priority. So how do we set the priority in router OS? By using a value that is called distance. The lower, the better. This main ISP or route can have a distance of one and the backup can have a distance of two. So this is the highest priority. That means that the traffic that is flowing from the user to internet will travel in that direction. The router needs to have some mechanism to verify if that gateway is up. So typically when we are adding those routes, we are going to use a field or feature that is called check gateway. And basically this can be using ICMP, sending a ping message or ARP, address resolution protocol. How does that work? Actually, it's pretty simple. So this router is going to be sending an echo request message or simply called PIN to the gateway's IP every 10 seconds. If the router loses two replies from the gateway, it's going to disable that route and then it's going to use the next route in the hierarchy. So in this case, the next one is going to be the one that has a distance of two. So that means that it's going to switch the traffic to the second ISP. So this process is performed automatically. When the ISP one is coming back and is online again, then router OS is going to know that and is going to switch the traffic again to the main internet service provider. So this is the most common way how we configure failover in router OS, but uh, probably we can find a better solution because what happens if there is a problem that is beyond the provider's edge device. So for example, if there is an issue with the distribution network, the ISP1, router OS will continue sending the ping to the local IP in the provider's edge device. And this is going to continue replying. So from the perspective of our border router, everything is online. But actually we know that there is an issue that is beyond the provider's edge device. And here is when the recursive routes come to play. So with recursive routing, basically we are going to use a next hop that is not directly connected to the local router. Now, instead of being relying in the reply from an IP that is directly connected, this router will be checking an external host, a public IP that is somewhere on the internet. If those IPs are not replying, that means that this provider is down and then the router can switch to the second ISP. So we are going to learn how to perform that process in the lab because that is the most important component in this video. But first we need to understand the step by step. So the logic behind this process. So the process is the following. First, we need to pick some external services. So you can say, for example, I'm going to use the Cloudflare 
public DNS servers or open DNS servers to monitor every service provider. Or you can have a VM in the cloud and you can be sending pings to that one and you don't rely on public services. But the process is pretty simple. First, we need to add the route. So basically we need to force using the IP 1001 to monitor if the ISP1 has internet access, then we need to force that all the traffic that is going to that IP will be sent to the ISP's one gateway. And that's the first step. Add routes to external host using a scope with a value of 10 intended to monitor if the ISP is up or down. So this is the command. We can do that in the Winbox as well. So the value is important, a scope. So I'm going to explain how that is going to play and how it's going to have some kind of interaction with the target scope. So this is the step one. Then the second step, once we have force that all the traffic that is going to 1001 is sent to the gateway from the ISP1, then we can create the default route. And instead of using the ISP's one gateway, we are going to use a non-directly connected IP. And in this case, it's going to be the IP that we are using to monitor the traffic. But the key point here is that the target scope is going to be 11 in our case. So this value must be less than the target scope. And why? This is something that is coming directly from the MyRotic website. Routes with a scope greater or equal than the maximum accepted value are not used for the next hop lookup. So you go to the MyRotic documentation, you'll find that we have the scope, we have the target scope. So this rule is telling if the scope is greater or equal, that is not used for next hop lookup. So we are adding a route to monitor the IP 1001 and we set the scope to 10, for example. So basically we'll have that scope and then the target scope by default is going to have a value of 10 because that is a static route. So that value is equal to that value. So the scope is going to be equal to the target scope in that case. And basically that can't be used for nest hop lookup. We need to increase the value for the target scope. And that's why I'm setting 11. Because if we have 11, now the scope is going to be 10. And the target scope is going to be 11. So now the scope is not greater or equal to the target scope. And we can use that IP as an S hop. During this session, I'm going to use the topology that you can see now. The ISP1 connected to Ether1, the ISP2 connected to Ether2, and Ether3 is providing connectivity to the local area network. So now we need to pick some IPs on internet. In my case, I'm going to use 1.0.0.1 to monitor the internet service provider 1 and 4.2.2.2 to monitor the ISP2. So the idea with the step one is that this router must have a route pointing to that IP, but that traffic will be sent to the ISP's one gateway. So in that way, we are sure that all the traffic going to that IP is being routed through the ISP1. So at the step number one, one key point is the scope value. Remember that the scope must have a lower value than the target scope in the default route. Let's proceed with the step number one. So I will go to the router. So this is the router. At this point, I only have the configuration of the IP addresses. If I go to IP addresses, we can see the IPs that are configured in every interface. So the ISP1 will have a gateway 10.1.1.1 and the ISP2 10.2.2.1. I'm going to IP route and I will add a new entry. 
I'm using router OS 7.1.2, but the process will be similar in any version of router OS 7. So the destination IP is going to be 1.0.0.1. So basically, this IP address that we have there, we need to send that traffic to the ISP's one gateway. So in my case, that gateway is 10.1.1.1. And here we have the option for setting the scope. So that value in our case is going to be 10. But actually, that value can be different. As long as the scope is having a lower value than the target scope in the default route, this route can be used for the next hop lookup. So now I'm going to set the value to 10. And I will click Apply. Let's add a comment. External host via ISP1. Now we are monitoring that IP by sending traffic through the ISP1. So the same logic applies with the second host on internet. But now that is going to be pointing to the ISP's 2 gateway. So let's go to the Winbox and we'll add a similar route. So the new entry is going to 4.2.2.2 and the gateway is going to be the ISP's 2 gateway. That in my case is 10.2.2.1. Again, the scope is going to be 10. Apply and a comment, monitor host via ISP-2. So we can go to the step number two. We'll add a default route with a target scope equal to 11. So the idea here is that this value must be greater than the scope. So for example, if I set the scope to 15, then I can easily set a target scope of 16, for example, or 20. So let's go and try that. The idea is pretty simple. So I'm going to add a new entry. And this is going to be the default route for the ISP1. And that is going to be the main one connection. So the idea with this default route is that instead of using the ISP's one gateway, we are going to use the external host and recursively the default route will resolve to the ISP's one gateway. So that means that if this IP is not responding, also this default route won't be available. And now we have solved the problem that typically we have if the issue is beyond the provider's edge device. So the configuration for the destination address is always going to be all zeros, then the gateway 1001, and the target scope is going to be 11. So this is also a critical step. So the target scope must be greater than the scope that we set in the previous routes. So if I click OK now, so you can see that this route is active. So you can see the A and S flags. That means active and static. So I will add a comment. Default route is going to be the main route. Additionally, we need to explicitly tell router OS 7 to be sending a ping every 10 seconds. And after losing two pings, router OS is going to disable that route. And we can easily get that done just by going to the route and looking for this option, check gateway. We are going to enable that field. You can see that we have the option for ping, we have the option for BFD and ARP. So in this lab, I'm going to use ping. BFD will be covered in one of the upcoming videos here in the channel. So by now we are going to use ping. This is going to be sending that echo request every 10 seconds. So I will click apply, OK, and you can see that this route is active. But for example, if I don't set the target scope to 11, if I keep the default value of 10, you can see that now that route is unreachable. Because by definition, routes with a scope greater or equal 
than the target scope are not used for next hop lookup. And in this case, this route has a scope of 10 and this route has a target scope of 10, so they are equal. So the previous route can't be used for next hop lookup. So I'm going to set 11 again. Now the route is active. The distance, this is important. You can see that the default value is one, so it's going to be the main route. But need, we need to have the backup route. So the backup is going to be via the ISP2. So in this case, the distance is going to be two. The gateway that we are going to use is the external host. And this recursively is going to point to the ISP's two gateway. So let's go to the Winbox and add that route as well. So this is the Winbox. I'm adding a new default route, all zeros, but the gateway in our case is going to be the monitoring IP for the ISP2, 4.2.2.2. And again, the target scope is gonna be 11. I will enable the check gateway and the distance is gonna be two. This has a lower priority than the main provider. So now I can click OK and comment default route backup. So you can see that we have those two default routes that will be sending the traffic to internet, but this is the main route that is active. If that ISP is having a problem, then the router after 20 seconds, after losing two pins, is going to switch to the backup route. So let's check how this works. So now I have a DACP server that is running in the LAN interface. So let's see if I go to this client over here, I will get an IP via the HCP. You can see that I have the IP 192.168.1.254. So if I ping google.com, you can see that now I have access to internet. And that is because the router has an active default route. So I should be using the ISP1. So if I trace google.com, we can see that that traffic is going via 10.1.1.1. That is the main route that is going via the ISP1. For example, if I change the priorities and I set the distance here to three, now the active is gonna be the backup route. And if I repeat this command in this computer, now the traffic is going through the second ISP. I will go back with my initial configuration and I will set this to one because I need ISP1 as the main connection. So I will repeat this command and now it's going through the ISP1 again. This is the ISP1 router. I only need to drop all the traffic that is going out the Ether2 traffic coming from remote host. So I'm going to use the forward chain out of Ether2 and I will drop the traffic. So basically like this to generate a problem in the provider's network. So if I enable that rule, now the pin going to 1001 is not going to reply and eventually this route will become inactive. So let's wait a few seconds after losing two echo reply messages, this is going to be down. So you can see that this is red and we can see some kind of bug in Winbox at this point. So we can see that the backup route is still blue but if I just close that window and I open again the window, we can see that actually it's active. So it's not refreshing the content of the window, but um, the change has been performed. So if we are monitoring this at the terminal level, we'll see that this is changing automatically. And now this PC, if I start sending a pin to google.com, this replies, if I send a trace route to google.com, this is going through the ISP number two. If I go back to the providers and I disable that route, so we'll have connectivity again. So you can see that the main route is active again. 
But again, the green box is showing this in black. But actually, if I just refresh the window, now that's blue. And this is how the failover with recursive routing works in Router OS 7. That the process, two-step process, fairly simple. I hope this video has been informative for you, and I see you in the next one. Thank you.